Hi, this is John Krasinski, Pittsburgh Soccer Now. We are on Pittsburgh Sports Live. With me today, Mark Goodman, Soccer Rabbi. Mark, happy, well, it's, uh, it's already February here, and the Pittsburgh Riverhounds have kicked off preseason training camp, so why not a better time for us to kick things off here? Well, let's let's start real quick by 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 having a little bit of, of witty banter. Uh, one, you and I are now brothers. We we both have made it through the COVID, and two, we're also brothers in our respective wood paneled basement scarf collection backgrounds. I, mean, I think that is really something notable. Um, you know, mine is like a two a two level effect. One is up against the wall, and the other one is hanging off some pipes here. Um, you got a nice collection behind you, and I, it looks like you have the exact same hound scarf on your left and on your right, which is really impressive. Well, that and I mean that first year, I think they, I ate somehow, I don't know how this happened, but I had ended up with about thirty of those. Um, so you know, I'm sure it's it's fine now. Um, they won't come back and ask me for them back. But yeah, the uh, the opening night, I think it's the opening night scarf there that's flanking the both sides of the uh the bar stool back there but uh yeah so uh just hey look we can get what we can get up behind us make it look colorful make it look good make it look fun um it is a beautiful game um yeah i'm excited about 2022 for a lot of reasons um it's a world cup year obviously the riverhounds have gone i think they've put all their chips on the table i uh, you know i think this is they're going all in this year mark uh, that's really my assertion just looking at what they've done to bring everybody back that they pretty much that they really wanted to bring back and then on top of that all the five pretty decent signings including the usl championships all-time leading scorer dane kelly that, that's a pretty pretty good off season wouldn't you say mark yeah, so the key signings I think that you you brought up, um, Danny Griffin, who's kind of the pit bull of the midfield, who really you know runs lanes and breaks up plays, but also distributes wide very well. Canardo Forbes, King Kenny, all time assist leader for the Riverhounds, um, getting up there in years, but he is you know your ideal kind of Beth, Ben Roethlisberger pocket passer. He he stands back, he picks things out, he can also still get forward and score. You have the the speed and the kind of breaking the back line ability of Albert Dequa coming back. I, I have to interrupt though. This is oh go. We're su- between um, almost Super Bowl time here. I guess it's Super Bowl time here, and you've used the first American football reference before I have, which I'm impressed. It's rare. I'm, yeah, it's extremely rare. rare. That's why I had to point it out. I'm sorry. I had to no, it's great. Um, Russell Cicerone is back. He's, he's been fantastic for the team. And then the, the back line um, bringing back former Colorado Rapid, Mikel Williams, uh, uh, an, a uh, Trinidad and Tobago international. Um, and then uh, Mikel uh, added an additional buddy from the Trini team, uh, the Soka Warriors, uh, Jesse Williams. Um, and then the team has picked up uh, f- four other uh, players um, before the season has started, Robbie Dambrot, former Riverhound, former uh, pit player as well. Player, yeah. um, Angelo Kelly Rosales, who um, comes over from Charleston. I have to think of him. He's kind of a, an older player, 31. He's a good, uh, I think he's 31. Um, I think he's actually 20, 26 or 27, somewhere in that. Oh, point. my bad. Yeah, I don't remember. Getting him mixed up with Dane Kelly is could just be. turned 30, I think. Could be, but um, Kelly Rosales is kind of a, a I, I wrote something on Twitter about him the other day. He's, he's kind of a, a, a regular starter, um, you know, a tough in the tackle defensive midfielder um, who I think if, if I, if I remember correctly from what I wrote the other day in like four seasons with Charlotte, most uh, in Charlotte with uh, Charleston, mostly starting, I, he still has yet to have a goal in USL, which is interesting. Right. Um, and then you've got a goal, the, but he's, his yellow card totals are pretty high. Right, 20, 21 yellow cards, if I'm not mistaken. And then you said it, uh, Dane Kelly is uh, the all-time uh, – he's the Bull Durham of uh, – of, uh, <laughs> There it is. Crash, yeah, that's a great – Crash great Davis of, of, of USL, the most goals uh, in USL, I think, history um, with something like 90 – 90 something or something like that so he'll i think he's sitting on 98 or 99 actually that's ridiculous he's gonna he's gonna crack 100 with uh 
with our Pittsburgh Riverhound. So I think you said it really well, which is that this this team is going for broke. They they really want to win it all. Um, you know the one the one area that we we still have yet to figure out, which is a very Bob Lilly thing to do, is you you're grinning because you know what I'm going to say. Yeah. Um, yeah. Is there's no goalkeeper yet because Bob is fickle with his goalkeepers. He's turned over goalkeeper um, almost every season that I've lived here uh, in Pittsburgh. So, and that's every season that Bob's been here. So it'll be interesting to see who they, who they pull for, for a goalkeeper. There's still some guys at the uh, former MLS players who are out of contract and may have a shot. There's always a few guys floating around the league in USL who might be interesting. And I'm sure they're trialing uh, a whole bunch of options right now. Yeah, I'm sure we'll see three, two or three guys this week and next week into the first couple of scrimmages and then kind of see where that goes. And it, I mean, they've signed, I believe they've signed three every year. Bob's been here. So that's three spots right there. They're, fifth, they're at 15 right now. And so if you figure they're adding three more keepers, uh, my assumption was that they would probably look at maybe another center back or two. I think they're in pretty good shape. Maybe another um, outside back that could play both sides, thinking something like that. Uh, and then, you know, and then we'll see what happens with MLS camps, right, Mark? I mean, you know that side of the uh, right. ball pretty well. And what Bob does is there's that period there, maybe one or two or three weeks into preseason camp where, now MLS camps have gotten into making some cuts and things like that. And then all of a sudden some other guys might become available. Um, I don't know. Yeah. That's going to see less of that this year mm -hmm. because major league soccer launched their reserve league, which they're fancifully right. calling MLS next pro. Um, and that means that I think a lot more of the uh, first, second and third round draftees that teams have picked up um, are going to go straight to these MLS next pro rosters. Although it was just announced this week, two weeks ago, um, uh, a writer for the athletic who also covers USL detailed what the, the rules are going to be of those rosters. And then yesterday, another detail just dropped, which is really interesting. There's no um, salary minimum in MLS next pro which means considering that the USL signed a CBA with their, with the USL players association last year, which guarantees some very basic minimums for players. Um, USL might actually be a better destination for some of these college players, uh, but it'll be up to their agents. The, the, the last thing I'll say on this though, is there are still a lot of kids who came out of NCAA division one and division two last year who were not drafted in MLS. In fact, MLS, got rid of the fourth round of the draft altogether this year. And a lot of the third round uh, teams passed altogether as well. I, I, so that, there are a lot a, of, yeah, there are a lot of good point. NCAA players. There are a lot of good NCAA players who are available. So. Absolutely. And you know, Bob, if anything, Bob and Dan Visser and company can do is they find those, you know, they'll find a diamond in a rough. Uh, they've done it with you know, Thomas Vanke, Azeel, players like Danny Griffin, so I, I'm sure they're looking out there and to have as many returning players coming back to the fold then to add maybe another type of player on the Danny Griffin, Thomas Van you'll have a very competitive situation going on in camp and throughout the, especially the early parts of the season. Um, I'm sure that's the way, that's what Bob and Dan and, and company are thinking. They're thinking, you know, build a competitive roster deep, deeper roster, be able to just sustain a 34 game season. It's, it's not easy, especially at this level. Um, you know, it's, it's not easy and we're still dealing with COVID. I mean, well, we don't know what the next two or three months will look like. We were sitting here thinking, you know, we were out of it and this is still going to be a factor. It's affected this team, how they finished last season, obviously, but it's still a, even though, you know, things are proceeding, everything's going to play a 32 four game season this and that it's still going to be a factor yep yeah um one interesting note i wanted to mention you you mentioned mls pro uh next sorry i'm it's, it's all new to me so it's uh, yeah it's a mess it's but a, rochester it's a uh interesting the rochester group which is sort of taking on the they're they're keeping the historical uh, Rochester Rhinos, uh, at least as part of their franchise, 
but moving forward with a new name, I believe it's just Rochester FC. Um, and, but what's interesting is that they will be in the open cup and, you know, I was speculating potential uh, for second round opponents for the hounds. Uh, if MLS to, uh, next teams will our division three could be paired up with division two. I'm sure we could speculate um, the pairing should be out any day this week. It's, they still haven't come out yet, but that would be pretty fascinating if, you know, Bob Lilly and the river hounds would take on Rochester in the second round of the open cup. It would be fun. Uh, it's interesting to note that the Rochester, New York FC team is the only independent team right. in MLS next pro I don't think any reporters have had a chance to sit down and talk to them about what the decision-making process was behind that, but that'll be a really interesting conversation um, when they have it of why did this independent team join a reserve league for major league soccer? The other interesting um, East coast U S open cup note that you may want to kind of keep an eye on is, um, you know, a couple months ago, uh, Detroit uh, city FC entered USL departing from NISA, who is the kind of iconoclastic third division uh, uh, league that was, you know, proclaiming they were going to do promotion relegation and they were all about the fans and all about, you know, open, open uh, kind of competition and having a more right. open system. Um, and recently there's been serious implosion, which if uh, you're following it in the news or on Twitter is worthwhile that uh, New Amsterdam FC out of uh, New York City has basically, you know, flamed them up and down for gross mismanagement, financial malfeasance, uh, going back on promises, um, creating a really, you know, unhealthy league dynamic. And, you know, just keeping an eye on this, this U.S. Open Cup and whether the NISA teams will play in it, whether the NISA teams whether NISA will survive the season, all of it is really exciting to watch as a neutral here in Pittsburgh. It'll be fascinating, but I think they need to, this needs to be like finalized in like, you know, ASAP because this will have to, they're, they're putting the schedules off, you know? So yeah, uh, Mark, final parting thoughts in terms of the Riverhounds. Uh, I've kind of phrased it as, is this, is this a, finish at the top of the table or bus type season for this team or what are, what are your expectations? What do you think they're, I'm sure they want to, I mean, they, they, they want to win a championship every year, but I mean, is the pressure really on now? They just have had un, one playoff win in Bob Lilly's four years now going into number, year number five. Do you think the pressure is on now? I don't think so. I, I really feel like the three-year contract that Bob Lilly signed last year and also just kind of an overall sense I get from Tuffy Schallenberger, the owner, and I'm sure you've heard this too as a, as a writer and reporter, is that like they're kind of like ride or die for Bob, that they really think that Bob Lilly is a really good coach. He's really good at picking out talent. Um, he, he produces results. And I think the last thing um for me and this is my take as a as a writer reporter thinker soccer nerd fan um a lot of people feel like you know coaching at the high end you have to absolutely produce you know cups uh trophies every single year um i'm more of a i believe in the billy bean approach uh which is the money ball approach and the money ball approach is basically saying that when you assemble a team you can plug in the numbers and plug in the talent and reasonably come up with a result that'll say, I have created a team that based on the players that I've signed and their um, performance in the past, they will finish one, two, three, four on the table. What they do in the playoffs in any given knockout one game situation, it's, it's six to five and pick them. It's, you know, the, the margins are so close in an individual game. You know, when, when the Riverhounds go to, um, you know, penalty kicks in matches or they go into extra time. Um, it's just really hard to tell what's going to happen. So I think they've got the, I think Bob's got the full faith and confidence of the front office um, and the ownership, no matter what I would say um, finishing top three in the Eastern conference is the expectation for Bob Lilly winning a trophy less. So, because I think we understand that like, if you can get to that top three, you know, it really becomes for my money, it's in the player's hands at that point. 
yeah, I think that's that's a great uh, takeaway in terms of this expectations. I, I really do also believe that when you look at the any sport, really, you get into the postseason tournament in good position, playing well, you know, in a relatively higher seed, just so that you, you know, if things fall your way, you get multiple home games. If not, you're confident enough to go on the road. I think where they were last year, they probably didn't want to be. They didn't want to start out the playoffs on the road. They were confident. I think they believed they could beat Birmingham. I think they, you know, they could have, could have progressed. Uh, and I think they're going to play this year with a little bit of chip on their shoulder because of that. And with as many returning players, I think there's a lot of motivation across the board. Agree. All right, Mark. Well, uh, before we wrap it up, just real quick, your thoughts on the U S men's national team, uh, game three of a three game swing. Uh, so far, they're one and one. Uh, the, the loss to Canada might sting a little bit, but really, if they bounce back tomorrow night, uh, Wednesday, um, I think they kind of right the ship, don't you? Especially with Mexico still a little bit behind. If they can get another three points, I think that will really put them in solid positioning. They're in better shape than they were four years ago. Um, four years ago, you know, they were they were they had four games to go, and they needed uh, a couple. They needed two wins um, and they didn't. And then they came into their final game, like needing a draw and then they didn't get it. And then everything else went wrong. Right. That's not to traumatize our, our viewers, but. Uh, oh, it's traumatizing. Back, I mean, right. It's remembering back to Corva in, in, in Trinidad and Tobago is, is something we don't really want to do, but um, you know, down, down the stretch, if I'm not mistaken, they have to play Honduras and then they face Mexico one more time, Panama one more time, and uh, I'm blanking on the fourth team. I feel like, yeah, every, so Guatemala, no, Guatemala's not in there. Um, no. Uh, Costa Rica? Is it Costa Rica? Yeah, then? Costa Rica. Yeah, yeah. Costa Rica. Um, right. So they have to get, I would say they, have, they need a, a win and two draws or two wins out of those final four games, and they're fine. Um, they cannot no height four matches in a row. Uh, that would put them into a bad place, but, um, but the odds of that are low. They have to do pretty, they, they have to do okay against Honduras. Things did not look good against Canada, but Canada has been on fire throughout this tournament. They have not lost a game. Um, I think the only thing that USMNT fans are screaming about uh, is the talent on the field wasn't gelling it didn't come together a lot of people are complaining about pennsylvania's own christian pulisic not pulling his weight there's a lot of speculation about what's going on there maybe he's tired maybe he's just having a lull maybe he struggles from the left side that he should be really be playing on the right instead of being uh you know be playing being played as an inverted winger from the left side some people think he should have been pulled altogether. Um, a lot of folks thought that, uh, that the main problem with the USMNT the other night in Canada was the situation at striker is not great. Um, Timothy Weah is the best striker in the pool, and he didn't have, he had one COVID shot, but not two COVID shots, which is good enough in France where he plays, but not good enough in Canada. So he wasn't allowed in. Right. Um, you know, they've rotated strikers, so they also didn't uh, want to go with Ricardo Pepe. Um, some fans thought that that was a poor decision by Greg Berhalter. We will see what they go with tomorrow night. I'm less worried. I think this team is deep. I think it's talented. Um, I think they don't look cohesive, partially because some of the players are tired. Uh, it was awfully cold last night. It'll be really cold in Minnesota tomorrow night. They're yeah. projecting negative 10 as a possible Crazy. real real temperature and that's not celsius that's fahrenheit um and then the last There's a thing, hubert h humphrey metrodome when you need it yeah right the old, the old um, metrodome in minnesota uh, they, i mean look, that's um, crazy. No. and the, the last thing i was going to say was that um th one of these challenges is that there's a couple ms mls guys who were kind of in the mix coming off the bench or or playing last night yeah and they're out of season like they're in they're in their preseason too and so all the passes are a little too hard or a little too soft or a little too far to the left or a little too far to the right. Like it's a little, everything's a little out of step and a little, little discombobulated. Um, 
which played into the hands of a team that's, you know, they can get a quick goal early and they're up 1-0, even though the U.S. controlled play. I think it yeah. kind of played into Canada's hands that the U.S. was still kind of, they're still not quite in form. Right. I would say yeah. three games into this rotation, this, you know, this three-game swing, hopefully game three, they can get into a little bit of a groove. Yeah, was there anything you saw about the game the other night that, you know, you seem to have a positive attitude with the way you framed it, but uh, but you don't seem as worried about what happened in, uh, in Canada as I am. Well, I, I, you know, my look at it is just stay the course. It's a road match in your qualifying. I mean, so that, that alone is, right. is a huge challenge. Uh, you know, that's not an easy place to play. They were playing on, uh, I guess, I didn't realize that Toronto FC, you know, they, they don't even play on grass. They play on the, the artificial stuff. You know, I, it does, you know, you can make excuses all left and right, but I mean, I think at the end of the day, you know, they're, they're, I think you're right. I think they need to find a little more cohesion. They had, they had the better of play for most of the match, but I'm looking for, you know, I'm looking for that final third. I mean, it just seemed like, yeah, yeah we don't, maybe the strikers are not, you know, not really, there was, I think Aronson maybe had the best shot on goal, which was from the edge of the box from what I could see, you know, from what I saw, they, they needed to create to kind of work to break down Canada a little bit more, bring them out of their shot. They, they defend, I thought the Canada defended well, um, limited U.S. opportunities to more difficult shots and things of that nature. Polisic definitely has looked like he's struggled. Um, he's just, it's creatively, he's just, I think he's tried, I think even McKinney tried to do too much with the ball at his feet at times. And I think that those things, these guys, I think still need to be able to trust each other a little bit more. Um, but yeah, you know, we'll see. I think it was just one game and they haven't lost really. So I think that's, that's, you know, it's okay to hit the reset reset button. Good. I like the positive attitude. That's a good. That's a good way of coming in. I like the. I like the confidence. And I think. Well, yeah. I think you're right. Honduras. Honduras on the road in minus ten conditions. <laughs> um, that should be an, an. Dare I say it? An easy win. So hopefully we get it. All right, Mark. Well, thank you so much for your time. Um, and uh, we look forward to chatting with you and we're going to be getting out and check out the hounds and training and uh, preseason games and all that kind of stuff. It uh, should be a fun uh, next couple months leading up to the to start of the season. I can't wait to get out there. And if I'm not uh, writing about it for, for our uh, PSN, I will be taking photos because I got a brand new camera, which I'm very excited oh, about. Yeah. And we got to get out to the new uh, AHN uh, facility as well. We'll be out there. They let us. In the coming weeks. Yeah, they're going to let us. So that sounds good. <laughs> All right, Mark. Thanks, thanks a lot. All right, we're back here with Jordan Smith, the PSN contributor, uh, mostly with the Riverhounds coverage. And uh, when high school season kind of hit the uh, hit the down the, the the playoff stretch, and then the PIAA's Jordan was also a huge contributor for us this past this previous year, 2021. But we're here, 2022, Jordan. Um, you busy guy you're doing a lot of things but um do appreciate your taking a few minutes tonight to talk with us about the river hounds and this 2022 season they've just kicked off preseason camp uh we'll probably get a look at them later this week uh at least live and in person but jordan uh your first you know i we just got done talking to mark uh, goodman and talking about the river hounds expectations this year from your perspective what do you think is it 2022 is it finish at the top of the table or bust for this team? Is the pressure really on or are they, you know, they just, what are your thoughts on that? Uh, I think uh, here on the outside, maybe like we don't, we don't put too much pressure on the Riverhounds. Maybe internally there's a lot of pressure. Uh, maybe Bob Lilly and um, the ownership and um, some people work that have worked there for a good bit, that core group, maybe they're thinking, you know, all right, this is finally, this needs to be the year that the river hounds really do it. Uh, they win the USL um, or at least make a run like towards the final um, or the Eastern conference. And, and my expectations is that they finally do make a playoff run, like a decent run where they win at least like two playoff games. Um, I mean, I, I don't think if they don't win at all, will I consider the season a bust? Probably not, but um, as long as there's not some embarrassing loss along the way. But, um, 
yeah, I'd like to see, you know, a push. Um, we'll, we'll see what happens. I, I don't want the team to get COVID again, like that happened this past season. I mean, who knows what they could have done. Um, they, they did beat Tampa twice this past year and, and Tampa made it to the final. So maybe they could have at least made it to the final. I don't know, but, um, yeah, we'll, we'll see what happens. Well, and I think you're, it's interesting. Your takeaway is similar to Mark's in some respect. And I, I think that's that there's this sort of cautious optimism that this team is being built, you know, they're being built to win. I, I, I look at it like they, they're definitely being built to win now. However, it's just the competitive nature of the USL championship, the, the Eastern Conference, some of the teams that they have to face. Just getting into the top, maybe the top, what Mark mentioned was maybe they get into that top three, you know, and then give themselves a chance come playoff time. And that's really, I think what, the way Mark presented it, I think was kind of the way, I, I kind of see if I'm running the team or if I'm running the franchise, I mean, that's what, you want at least. I thought last year they didn't really give themselves a chance. Yeah, they were they were they were confident heading into, but they, to start the, the playoffs on the road in Birmingham and then to make a deep run would have been a little bit more challenging, a little bit more travel, those kind of things. Yeah, I, I agree with what you said. I mean, the USL, it's basically like D1 athletics where it's like a transfer portal. I mean, it's very rare that these USL teams are keeping the same guys. But the Riverhounds, I mean, they, they're bringing back that core of Kenny Forbes, Alex Dixon, Russell Cicerone. I mean, this team is bringing back basically the whole starting lineup, I think, except for uh, Vidiello and Todd Wharton. Um, I mean, they lost some some other subs and stuff and uh, Tommy Williamson. But um, they, they pretty much are bringing their whole group back, which is pretty rare in the USL. Um, it's rare for most teams in any league uh, these days. So. Um, and I think the players that are returning, they all understand Lily Ball. They understand the five-two-three, the four-one-four-one system. They get it. So I don't think there's going to be a learning curve or anything. This team knows how Bob wants them to play. Um, it'll just be a matter of executing, and if they can finally get past uh, Louisville City <laughs> in the playoffs and finally make a run. Yeah, and I think you, you just made a good point about Lily Ball um, continuity, having guys come back year after year. You know, we, we always joked about the River, River Rhinos or the, um, hmm. yeah, that sort of thing where the, you know you had a lot of these guys coming in that had played for Bob previously in, in Rochester. And so that, I think, now that you're five years in and you have, you, know, you have a Canardo Forbes, basically, that's really it. I mean, you have Canardo Forbes, um, and then you have some other guys that have been with you for a while. You bring in Alex Dixon, who played for you in Rochester. So there's still all of these, these guys that are kind of part of the system that know Bob, and Bob knows them. And I think that really does matter, doesn't it? Oh, yeah, for sure. I mean, Bob's probably not the easiest coach to play for, not, not in a bad way, but um, just he's tough. He has a certain style. I mean, not many – not many teams want to play with five in the back, consistently always having five players back. I mean, I grew up playing outside mid, having to have that discipline. Some coaches were like, you know, oh, stay high. Some coaches like Bob Lilly, no, you run back every single time, defense first. So, um, you know, that that's a challenge for some of these players. Um, you know, I think the veterans respect Bob. And um, so I don't, I don't think there was ever any issues that I've seen the past year where players disagree. Um, but yeah, I think they have set themselves up a little bit better for this season. I still think they probably need to go out and get maybe one more forward type player. Uh, I wouldn't mind seeing another big defensive guy come in and, and they still don't have the goalkeeper spot filled. So right. we'll see about that. Right. So let's focus on the returning players though, for, if you will, um, we have, you know, defenders, they've, they've really stocked up. There's seven defenders, really. If you look at, you know, they have Ezra Armstrong, Jelani Peters, Danny Rivera, technically, you know, wide guy, outside back, kind of a hybrid mm -hmm. player, but also very versatile last year was Danny Rivera. Mm -hmm. um, Shane, we Shane, Shane Wheat um, and Mikhail Williams. Those are the returning guys. Then you added the Robbie Dambro, Dambrot and uh, Jesse Williams to that mix. And then you have your midfielders, as you mentioned, Bernardo Forbes and Danny Griffin. But then you throw in Angelo Kelly Rosales, who 
had most minutes for Charleston last year um, into that midfield trio. I'm sure they might want to add another midfielder or two central midfielder. Um, and then you've got right. forwards and wingers, as you mentioned, you know, Cicerone, Dequa, Dixon, um, all those guys are coming back. And then E Yang is a kind of a young player. Oh, actually not necessarily a young player, but a kind of a mid twenties. Uh, he's kind of meddled in different places was an Orlando city uh, product for a while there. Uh, and then of course, the USL championships leading scorer, Dane Kelly. But what about those returning guys? What about like the Ezra Armstrong or Danny Rivera? Um, Jill, those, all those defenders, what, what do you think about that group and how they will, what that's going to look like this year? Yeah. I mean, uh, someone like Ezra and Danny Rivera, Rivera clearly, um, more versatile than in Ar than Armstrong probably is. You're probably not going to see Ezra play center mid at all, like Rivera did at some times. But they too potentially could be the starting outside wingbacks, um, and they're bringing back basically that whole back line that they had last year. Um, sometimes there was some things I didn't like to see. Um, I mean, when you play at times when they're sort of at three in the back and the wingbacks push up, um, sometimes I felt like a few of them lacked a little bit of the technical skill. Um, or I, I mean, I think they have it, but just not every single time, like uh, sometimes too many giveaways from a few of them. Um, so if they, if they sharpen that up a little bit, um, I think that could potentially be good. I mean, I never really saw too many issues with like Shane Wheat, for instance, um, when he was at the right center back, right back uh, position, he did very well. Um, We'll, we'll see how they do. Um, I mean, I, I like who who's coming back. Ezra, very fast, very quick player. Um, so who knows, maybe he can burst out into a starting role and, and help produce for them. Yeah, and then Robbie Damrock, too, is, you know, he played, I think, 28 starts in Loudon, and, you know, it was him and Wheat played together at Pitt. They played together at Loudon. And now they're playing together with the Riverhounds. So that's interesting. And you got chemistry in the back line. You've got that. Those two know each other really well. Now, all of a sudden, you add Jesse Williams, who's a 20-year-old Trinidad Tobago player, to add to the two players you're just talking about. You know, you're talking about uh, Peters and, and Mikhail Williams. And so there's, right. there's guys that really know each other. That's, a, that's very interesting. Yeah, I just saw uh, Dan Brott's dad coaching uh, at Duquesne was just at that game. So um, it, if what I can tell from his father, he's probably a well-disciplined uh, guy. So because um, his dad, his dad's tough and expects a lot of his players. So um, I'm sure he'll be the, the same way. But yeah, it looks like there's some. I think playing for a coach like Bob Lilly, uh, I think Robbie can handle that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. <laughs> Um, yeah, a lot, lot of chemistry in the back line. Um, let's just hope they can bring in a goalkeeper that can communicate well with them. Uh, when you have to set up a wall, you have to check out wide, whatever you need to do for your goalkeeper. Um, yeah, we'll, we'll see what happens, but, um, looks like a, a decent back line. Um, I just hope those guys that started last year that do probably start again this year that, uh, they just clean it up sometimes on, on the foot skills. I think having that second year together, I think will really, really help. Uh, and I'm sure yeah. that's part of the Lily ball philosophy as well. Just keeping those guys together uh, for sure. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, uh, any other thoughts on the return? I mean, you've got, you've got Canardo Forbes, maybe, and Dane Kelly on the same field, the, the all-time leading assist player and uh, all-time leading scorer. That that should be a pretty interesting dynamic duo uh, if if given a chance. I think um, that would that, that, I'm curious to see how that how that works out. Yeah, I, I think that'll be a big story throughout the whole season. Uh, very cool. I mean, um, if people have been following USL soccer, those are two or two of some of the biggest names. And Alex Dixon as well. And, and Russell Cicerone seems like he's, you know, after last season, that looked like a breakout year for him. Um, and I felt like he could could have even scored more. I, I think if you ask him, he'd probably say the same thing. So, um, I mean, that's four weapons right there. Mm -hmm. I don't know if Dane Kelly, if Bob Bully is going to want to start him every single game and make him play 90 minutes every single game. Um, you know, same with Dixon and Forbes. These guys are in their early 30s now. But, uh, yeah, very intriguing. It's cool bringing in, in big names like that. I, I think ownership has done a good job being willing to pay some of these guys. I, I think all excellent points. I really – 
go along with that. I think you got the three of those really big name players, if you want to call a big name for USL level, um, you know, those three guys in particular, I think you, there's going to be some, you know, kind of watching the minutes and that sort of thing. And I know I wouldn't have a problem with that, especially in the first, you know, 18 to 20 games. Uh, it wouldn't be surprised at all. And, and the schedule's a little more spread out. So there's not as many week, yeah. you know, weeknight games and, and midweek games and things like that. There will be some of that, but at, with the open cup and those type of things, you might see, you might not even see too much of Canardo, uh, Dane Kelly, those guys. The other thing is you bring up another good point. I mean, if Dequa it can get into really good form and stay healthy, then you can max you can maximize uh, Dane Kelly when you when you do you utilize him and not run him to the ground. Um, you, look, Bob knows he's done this. He needs his forwards to play two ways and play hard, and he's not going to be able to play a Dane Kelly ninety minutes a game. I mean, I just don't see that um, for most of the season. But he's going to. And I'm sure that, like you said, there's going to be another forward out there or two who, uh, you know, Yang and maybe a couple other guys that are going to be part of a rotation to keep the Dane Kellys and even the Dequas fresh. Yeah, agreed. I mean, I think it goes, uh, I think it's underrated for Cicerone and um, Dequa, how much defense they play. I mean, just watching them, they sprint so much. They're sweating so much after the games. Um, they, they work so hard and because they know under Bob Bully, if they don't do that, um, they might get taken off or um, get subbed out late. You know, um, that's what Lily expects out of his players. So, um, yeah, I think they might use Dane Kelly sort of like they used to use Steven Dos Santos, you know, starts here and there. or Sometimes he's that second half hero sub, you know, something like that. Um, but we'll see. I'm excited to see him in a River Hounds uniform. For sure. And we are excited about the season and moving forward. The preseason starts February 12th. The Hounds will face a doubleheader. They'll play Westchester FC and Villanova. So two Eastern PA squads, one college, one, uh, I guess it's League Two uh, group uh, coming over. Uh, to play at Highmark Stadium. All the preseason games will be at Highmark Stadium. And I think it's a good segue. Uh, oh, actually, except for the pit scrimmage, they will play pit at Ambrose Urbanic Field. So uh, it's all home cooking for the preseason. And honestly, that's that's great. I mean, in terms of keeping the travel to a minimum. Um, but Jordan, mm -hmm. I, I'd like to pick your brain. You know, you've worked and interned for various uh, sports franchises in around our city and you know, you name it, you've probably been involved and then you work in college athletics as well. But, you know, talk about the Riverhounds game day experience. I interviewed Vic Gregovitz, the Riverhounds president, and he's had some, you know, last year was his first year under the wing, uh, handling the, this role. And he's really responsible for bringing in the revenue and, and generating, you know, getting more fans to come and the attendance last year. I think considering everything that happened with COVID, it was a decent bounce back. I think it started slow, but they, as he said, there were some good Saturday night crowds and especially as the season came to a close, but you know, you've been there, you, you worked with the Riverhounds at times and um, just what the game day experience, what do you think right now? I know they're talking about adding to the tailgate zone and doing those type of things, but what can they do to enhance that game day experience to make, get more fans to come out? Well, I'll say this first. Um, I interned there back in uh, spring of 2016, I think, or 2017, something like that. But uh, yeah, like four or five years ago, and it was a great experience. Um, I'll say this. We, we, it wasn't uh, unorganized at all or anything like that. I mean, guys like John Roth, Scott Gibson, they make that place run. Um, they work so hard, put in so many hours. But uh, the whole internship program, it was definitely um, – like it was sometimes inconsistent who was going to be in there, who was going to be helping. Um, you kind of saw new faces and then a lot of people were only there every once in a while. But I really noticed um, myself being at all the home games practically this past season. They had such a consistent work group uh, of interns and stuff like they had a solid core group um, and it, it looked very, very organized, everything. So they've clearly improved on that. So I think that helps. Level of professionalism has, has, yes. has gotten better. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
it's it's looking more like like they really are a professional team, not just like uh you know like a single A baseball team that you know hopes to have a, a decent crowd. But um yeah, I thought they did well with the tailgate zone last year. Um, I mean, I didn't partake in that. I'm I'm not getting drunk before uh, I cover the games, but or anything. Oh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, they bring us food. You know, Grubba brings us food, so that's always nice. Um, but yeah, I, I there to Mac Rubba, the Riverhounds director of communications, uh, for yeah, yeah, he takes good care of us. He, he does, yeah, good food. Um, so yeah, I mean, I think they've done a better job, um, for sure. I I saw some stuff online about Tuffy Bucks. Apparently, that's going to be a thing, um, where you get the, like like what looks like a dollar, and it says Tuffy Bucks on it, and that gets you like a free soda or a free beer. So I think that's a cool concept. And then they're talking about bringing in the app. Um, I think, I mean, really, um, it's it's so tough in Pittsburgh because we are spoiled with six Super Bowl rings, five Stanley Cups. And I know the Pirates haven't won in decades since way before I was born. But um, uh, the Riverhound, similar to the Pirates, they have a beautiful stadium, but they're not selling out. The Riverhound, it's beautiful, a great view of the city. But um, I mean, you know, they have like 3,000, 2,000 some tickets sold here, but you really would love for it to be like over 4,000 because they, they fit about 5,000 in there. It would be awesome for it to be four, 4,500 consistently on every Saturday night, you know, Sunday night type game. I think, I don't know how they can do it, but I wish they could fix the parking. I think that might stir some people away. Um, not a whole lot, but I wish it was a little bit uh, cleaner getting out of there. Um, that That's an issue. But um, I think the professionalism has increased a whole lot. And someone like Grubba, who's come in and, and he's the head of uh, PR there, I think he's done a terrific job. That, I mean, that that makes uh, the life way easier for Bob and the ownership. Um, but your your article with Vic, I think they they keep continuing on those plans, maybe add seats. Um, it really, it's just, if you just win that one first championship, then it's like, all right, you've entered, you've entered Pittsburgh sports because we're just spoiled. We want winning and they aren't a bad team, but, um, you know, Pittsburgh fans, they just want to see playoff wins and, and championships. So I think if they get that first one, they build, build a culture, um, they're expanding out there in Montour, building the, the complex. I, I think it's coming together and I think Vic's doing a great job. Yeah, and just he hasn't even been with the club for a year. So I, I do mm -hmm. sense a lot of those things. And so, yeah, I think it's going to be an interesting year in terms of that. Maybe can they turn up, turn things up a notch in terms of Vic was very excited about the fact that m almost every home game this year will be a Saturday night game, which yeah. you know, we saw some Sundays. We saw some other things last year and i think that might have interrupted some momentum um where the wednesday night, too. Wednesday night or wednesday night or friday night yeah. uh and then once you get into september it's just it's a crapshoot with everything else that's going on so uh it's always imperative to have a really good summer so for the second year in a row they, they will not have a fourth of july game uh, which is interesting and i know that was usually a guaranteed sellout so they're going to have to work and yeah, then have to kind of work to, to, to deal without not having that kind of automatic sellout. But I think they're, they're, they're working hard. I think one of the areas where Vic pointed out too, was, you know, this right now with COVID is still a factor and, you know, you can't so get groups, you can't get the group packages as much as they did mm -hmm. pre COVID. And that's definitely a factor as well. So I, We'll see. We'll see how things go. I, I think that they, it would be nice to see them average over 4,000 one of these years. They haven't averaged for over 4,000 fans since they moved into Highmark Stadium. But they've never, they haven't averaged 4,000 fans since the first two seasons, um, way right. back in the day when they were at Bethel Park. So, mm -hmm. that's, I mean, that's a realistic goal, right? You would just think that, hey, can they get over 4,000 fans? Uh, I think that, that would be a nice, nice, um, nice thing to see. Yeah, I mean, um, it's not like you have to expect them to be like the Penguins and have a sellout streak that goes over for 10 years. Um, I mean, the numbers are different. Penguins have 
18,000 seats. The Riverhounds have 5,000. We all know soccer still isn't the biggest sport in America. It's it's not the biggest sport yet here in, in Western PA, and it probably never will be with the, the Steelers. Um, but it, it does suck in a way that they kind of are competing with the other Pittsburgh sports, specifically the Pirates, since, you know, will will a casual fan have a for, season? I mean, who knows, right? Yeah, yeah, that's true. That, that, that might help them. But would a casual fan prefer the Pirates Stadium over the Riverhounds? You know, I don't know. A lot of casual people just think soccer's boring. That's something you have to deal with. But one person, um, I talked to someone who's worked in sports for literally over 50 years. They just retired. They told me they've heard from their sources throughout the, the NHL and uh, other major leagues that really, you know, um, unless something gets really worse with COVID, something gets really serious that a lot of these organizations uh, starting this summer, they're going to get back to hiring. They're going to get back to selling out the whole stadiums if they can. Um, they're going to, you know, they're going to basically move on from COVID and kind of get normal because the whole world can't live like this forever. Um, whether people agree or disagree with that, um, they're going to sell the tickets to the people that want to go. So maybe those group packages can come come back. Uh, maybe they won't be too prevalent in March or April, but maybe once it gets nice outside, June, July, August, um, maybe they'll, they'll they'll start to sell more tickets. But yeah, over 4K a game, um, mainly, mainly on Saturday nights, I think that's a realistic goal. Well, we will watch closely and we will be there. Jordan, you and I, yeah. Mark, I think the three of us for sure. Uh, we'll sprinkle a little bit of Ed Thompson in there. And I'm sure he'll make his way out to some games this year as well. Uh, but yeah. we're excited about the coverage and what, what's to come. And the preseason um, you know, starts February 12th. The doubleheader, as I mentioned, there's going to be some other really good preseason matches. Louisville City and the Indy 11, uh, just to see them play Pitt, I think is... Now that Pitt has, we haven't seen the Riverhounds play Pitt since they've um, done some really special things. So that should be fun, uh, even though it's the spring season for Pitt. Uh, and then just kind of wrap things up with Louisville City. And um, I think they finish up with WVU, which is another fun, fun soccer team uh, down there. And, um, you know, I think they've, they've made a run to the Elite Eight. So it'll be fun to see a lot of those talented players from WVU as well. So it should be a really, really fun preseason. And uh, I know, I don't know, what, what are you looking forward to the most this preseason? Yeah, um, I guess we'll, we'll see what goalie they get. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, I don't think it's a, a make it or break it position in the USL. I mean, I don't think anyone sees a goalie in the USL where they're like, oh, this guy's unstoppable, never going to beat him. And I don't think there's a goal in the USL where you think uh, he's so bad, it's so easy to beat them. You know, um, I mean, some players have more younger, basically kids, 17, 18, 19, 20 years old, um, playing at the at the USL level. Um, but, yeah, we'll, we'll see what goal they get. Um, I'm sure there might be a few more pickups, um, maybe, maybe some midfielders like you were mentioning. Uh, they seem to be lacking a little bit there. Um, but, yeah, in the preseason, I mean, facing Pitt and WVU, will they start their whole starting 11, their true starting 11? I don't know. Uh, probably not. Uh, it'll probably be a random mix. Um, but very cool. I don't I don't know yet if I'll be at those games, but if I'm able to watch or, or be there, especially the one at Pitt, I mean, going there and playing it, uh, which is also a great venue. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And Bob, good. Yeah, Bob will go with his – a lot of times he's kind of builds guys up as the preseason goes. And they usually do this, like, 60-30 thing with their right. playing guys in and out, usually 60-minute rotation, 30. But if they play a doubleheader, they'll do the same, you know, 60-30, maybe even 45-45 early on with a lot of trialists getting – Really, you still mm -hmm. don't want to look at all the trial guys that are trialists as well, um, which we have not seen the trialist list yet. Um, the team has shared that in the last couple of years. Normally, and even going back before that, we never really saw who the trialists were. But uh, until we got out for scrimmages and say, "Hey, who's that guy that just scored?" You know that kind of thing. But <laughs> um, but yeah, it's that's kind of the fun things that go along with the preseason is just kind of seeing how this team really will come together. Yeah, yeah, it should be cool. Um, those preseason games, I'll, 
I'll definitely be looking at I, I know it'll probably be tight scores, you know. I'm not expecting Cicerone to go out there and score a double hat trick against Pitt. But to me, I think in those preseason games, it's like, um, how's the defense really looking? Are, are they giving up a really soft goal? Um, or, you know, is there any moment where they just look clueless, like what's going on? I mean, that's any sport. You watch preseason football. I mean, you see bonehead plays all the time. It's like, what's this guy doing? I mean, most of those guys aren't the starters, but um, yeah, I'm looking forward to that. See how clean they're playing right out the gate against some of these college teams. All right. Well, Jordan, thank you so much for your time tonight. And I really look forward to working with you again this year in Riverhound season. And uh, good luck with all of your other adventures. I know you're busy with Point Park and helping Duquesne basketball and things like that. So, uh, but we'll be in, we'll be in touch and uh, appreciate your time tonight. Yeah, no problem. It was fun. Thanks. Hi, Jordan. Thanks.